this is the Check It Out podcast from the Moraine Valley Library. I'm Troy Swanson. I'm Tish Hayes. I'm Joe Malarkey. And this is the first podcast in a series of podcasts around uh, Giovanni's Room, which is our one book, one college selection for 2014-2015. And I think to start us off, Joe, you wanted to talk a little bit about James Baldwin. Right, the author. Um, Because I just want to be sure that people are familiar with um, him beyond just this novel. Uh, Because he's really one of the most highly considered American writers. Mm -hmm. Um, This year marks the 90th anniversary of his birth. Okay. That'll that'll be, that's in August. Um, And it's a good time to look back at what he did and how it applies today. Um, because actually the bulk of his no- work that he was best known for was um, nonfiction essays, um, heavily read at the time. A lot of things about civil rights, civil justice. Um, and when did he first come on the scene? Okay, so he was born in 24, okay, and so we'll, we'll do that. Um, as a high schooler, <clears throat> began writing for the high school newspaper. Okay. Okay, um, went and knocked on Richard Wright's door, who was a published um, mm-hmm. African American writer, and said, "I, I want to become a writer." Wow! And <clears throat> and it was that informal, and Wright, um, you know, took him on and, and encouraged him. Um, now they have a falling out that comes later. Um, he be. Um, Baldwin is making his money as a um, mainly a reviewer, a book reviewer, and he gives a negative review to Native Son, um, uh, and it, it opens his first collection of essays. Um, it's called Everybody's Protest Novel, and it was saying that the characters were flat and they were symbolic; they didn't represent real people. Okay, and um, with that, I mean, Wright was a gentleman, never said a bad word about Baldwin in public. Okay, just dropped him like a bad habit. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, but he becomes um, an important, like, voice in Baldwin. Baldwin yeah. does uh-huh. um, in the public dialogue. Okay. Okay, and is publishing fiction um, first fiction book is um, a memoir of growing up in Harlem. And I should back up. So let me explain his background to you. Um, He was born in, you know, pretty dire straits. Um, His family lived in in Harlem. And um, then his family was also very religious, Christian. He was called to the pulpit as a 14-year-old. And he preached for three years. Um, Then he did leave the church after that. Um, but one of the things I think when you read him, um, and also if you go and, and find clips of him, and, and certainly we've got a couple documentaries here in the library where you can hear him speak, um, he has that command right. that like a really good preacher has. And these are online <clears throat> documentaries that they can search and watch. Online. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we'll yeah we'll certainly talk about that. Um, so he has um, in his twenties moved to France. Okay. Um, and we also have a documentary about that, about um, African-American writers really finding a sort of personal freedom um, that they could not find. They were felt under such social pressure here in the States, okay, um, that they couldn't, they, they had to leave in order to really sort of find their voice or keep their voice and kind of keep their sanity, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Um, so he publishes a, a novel, um, Go Tell It on the Mountain, which somewhat is, it's, it reflects his childhood. You know, he borrows stories from his childhood. Um, but it's, it's not a, an autobiography. Um, and he, it gets great reviews. Um, it sells modestly at best, okay? And he realizes that there is only such a market for um, African-American stories, Okay. okay. There's only so much of an interested readership at this point, which is the the late '40s. Okay. Okay. Um, so he's writing essays. Um, he's getting published, and then he writes this this novel, Giovanni's Room. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And one of the things um, I should say, because I do recommend reading the nonfiction, um, it's really only in the fiction novels that he wrote that he discussed same gender relationships. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So you really don't find much of a dialogue about that in the nonfiction. Okay. And, um, you know, and so, you know, I mean, what do we want to say about it? I mean, historically, there's a whole bunch of things. You know, the, the Kinsey reports had come out, and so there was 
what was believed to be statistical dialogue or statistical data that showed, um, you know, male same gender behavior, female same gender behavior. Okay, so the, the Kinsey reports were 48 and 53. Okay, um, something else that's going to happen too, and actually if you, if you blink, you miss it in the book. Um, the character David says that he had a, some kind of a relationship with somebody in the military who then was kicked out of the military, and he right. was afraid it would reflect back on him. That was really common too. Um, it was considered conduct unbecoming. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so people got a dishonorable discharge. And one of the things that happened was everybody was needed during the World War II effort. Like every pair of hands was needed. Okay. Well, all of a sudden you had this bloated military. You had people who had gotten training who might never have sought this type of job. Okay, or that type of training would not have gone to a college, mm -hmm. and they've been displaced. They've been, you know, given skills they had before, and they're thinking, "Yeah, I could do this for a living. This wouldn't be a bad career." And it's I've already started it. Okay, so what happens is the the um, the government needed to pare down the post war. Um, service, armed services, right. and they did it multiple ways, and one of them was to go after um, people who had um, either exhibited or were known or suspected of lesbian or gay behavior. Um, one of the things, we've got a couple of documentaries in the collection that you can see that. Um, there's one coming out under fire um, where these people are interviewed, gosh, it's probably about... 30 years after the fact. Um, some of them still, it's about a handful of them, some of them still do not want to show their face. Um, it was such a painful experience for them. Okay, and also there's a documentary called Before Stonewall. Uh, Stonewall is considered a, a point in um, gay, lesbian, uh, civil rights. Okay, uh -huh, right. so actually you're going to see in the catalog we have a documentary Before Stonewall, we have a documentary of the Stonewall Riot, and then we have a documentary called after stuff. Okay, so we, we do the whole right. we do the whole span. Okay, uh -huh. but anyways, um, so you can get a sense of that there. So it's where, for instance, David is saying, he says at one point, "This is illegal in my country." Well, it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and actually, um, oddly enough, um, the first state to um, drop sodomy laws. Okay, right. Anybody want to guess which one? Illinois. It was Illinois. Okay. It was indeed. Wow. Did you know what year? No idea. No. 1962. Wow. And you can go to the ACLU's website if you want to double check me on this one, but I, I, I did my homework on this. Yeah. <laughs> they, they revisited their, um, their um, penal statutes. And, uh -huh. um, and that had been a recommendation from, um, a, I, I, oh no, the affiliation of lawyers. I'm sorry, I can't remember who it is. Look it up. Okay. If, if you're listening to this, you're probably near a computer. Look it up. Okay. <laughs> but to go on then. Um, so Baldwin publishes this novel, okay, um, becomes a very active spokesperson in the civil rights movement in, especially the 1960s, is, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, at the March on Washington, okay, okay. 1963. We uh -huh. just passed the 50th anniversary of that. Um, is well read, is published in all of the major you know, magazines and, and, you know, being asked mm -hmm. and that. And um, then, you know, what happens next, um, it's, it's one of those things where somebody is a spokesperson of their time and it may not last. Right. Um, like, you know, for instance, there was a time where following him would be, say, Susan Sontag. Okay. Is she read by um, young people today in the way she was read in the day? Well, and there's, there was a recent New York Times article just a couple months ago, I mm -hmm. think, kind of anticipating his 90th, um, you know, 90th, 90th birthday, um, saying that to some degree James Baldwin isn't taught anymore and risks being forgotten. And, mm -hmm. You know, is he one of those authors that's of his time and then time moves on? And I don't know. I mean, I love Giovanni's Room, and that's why we picked it for this one book. I don't think that's true, and I think there's a need to bring him back and and to talk about him because he was so widely read and influential. And now you've been reading him wider, Tish. Yes, I just started reading his Conversations, which is a book of interviews mm -hmm. that we have here in the library. 
And I think, you know, one of the things that is notable about Giovanni's room, I think, is that he, so it's this tragic love story on one hand, um, and it's heartbreaking, um, and it's about this relationship and, you know, identity and shame, but reading Baldwin's conversations around race and identity, I think really put into perspective how political he was and the kind of work that he was doing around these issues. And when you bring that um, social consciousness and understand how aware James Baldwin was of those issues into reading Giovanni's Room, you suddenly see a much deeper story and that James Baldwin is using these characters in some way, I mean, they're full characters, but he's using it to comment on you know, bigger issues going on in society. Um, whether that's gender roles, social roles, privilege, you know, all of those things are layered within Giovanni's room. Right, right. And if you're, you know, if you don't know Baldwin, um, I mean, I think Giovanni's room is totally accessible from many levels. So yes. it's, it's something you can pick up and read and enjoy and find, um, I mean, the writing is great and it's... it's yeah, beautiful um, language. Yeah. But then when you know Baldwin, it adds these layers, like you're saying, that you can pull out that maybe you miss in general. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And then something else I, I just want to bring up in terms of, like, say, his legacy to us, right, okay, right. is um, he was um, very influential as he was active in civil rights um, um, activities. Um, he got to know Maya Angelou, and he heard her tell story after story of her life, and she had a, a very... A, amazing life story and he said you really need to write this um, and another person that he was um, very encouraging of early in her work as a fiction writer was Toni Morrison okay mm -hmm. now a third person so 50 you move the clock up then 15 years he's teaching at Mount Holyoke College and a young undergraduate, Suzanne Laurie Parks, okay, is taking a writing class with him, and he says to her, you know, you write dialogue so well, I think you should write drama, okay? I realize she's not a household name to a lot of people, but in the theater world, she's really significant. Um, uh, won the Pulitzer back in 2003 for her play Top Dog, Underdog, okay? Um, first African-American woman to do so. And um, she did this project the next year where she challenged herself to write short plays every single day. And so the project becomes 365 days, 365 plays. Um, six years ago, in 2008, these things were then um, performed. It started with about two dozen theater companies in the States who said, okay, we'll take two weeks and perform okay. it. Okay, oh. well, we'll take another two weeks. Okay, and then with the internet, it went viral and went international. It is the largest collaborative theater project ever. Like, nobody's even done this with Shakespeare, is basically what it is. And so what I want to say without, you know, going on and on and on about, um, but I, I did want to sort of preface or at least explain who Suzanne Laurie Parks is for people who, who aren't familiar. But if you take away <clears throat> the works of... Maya Angelou, okay, and how influential she was with uh, memoir, right. okay, and, and, and how important that her first book became, but all of her books, even up to this past year, um, Mom and Me and Mom, you know, um, she made people really rethink the importance of, like, personal memoir. Mm -hmm. Toni Morrison made people rethink the novel, and as she would point out, the point of the novel is to be novel. It's to do something a little bit different, okay? And then you've got Suzanne Laurie Parks rethinking, because people would say to her early in her career, I don't know what these are, but they're not plays, you know? Uh -huh. So she was sort of challenging the status quo of what should be theater. And so if you take the three of these three important writers out of the mix of the last 45 years, to me, you get this great big crater. Right. Okay. In our collective thinking. And Baldwin made it happen. Right. Right. Well, he was, he, you know, that he was some kind of um, an, an important, you know, whether it was just a champion, an encourager, you know, an enthusiast, because they all credit him, you right. know. Right. I mean, they all say, you know, that he was, was really significantly important. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I mean, I think that's part, maybe part of the power of um, Baldwin is as we've been prepping for this one book, so, you know, he is, 
so many different things with so many different people mm -hmm. as you know all many great writers are and so um, when I talk to people, you know, maybe from um, African American community, mm -hmm. they own him in a certain way, and uh, people from the LGBTQ community own him from, in a certain way, and um, the lit teachers own him in a certain way, and um, whether it's his fiction Very, or his nonfiction, they own him in a certain that's way. That's a great like, point because they, that's the thing he represents different things to different people, right. and and he really was trying to say you can't reduce a single human being to one idea, right. Well, you and know, I and I think and what I hear and Tish I think saying, he sort of achieved that. In yeah, what you're saying. Well, and one of the things that Giovanni's room does, and I think what I hear Tish saying, sort of putting words in Tish's mouth, you can <laughs> you can correct me. Okay. But one of his the power when you really study him is to not just put him in the African American writer box, the gay American writer box, mm -hmm. the civil rights activist box, but that to connect these boxes is to really understand James right. Baldwin. Yeah, and I think he, you know, in his conversations, in his writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, he gets to, I think, what is being talked about a lot in all kinds of activist communities, which is the idea of intersectionality, that we can't ever, right, separate these pieces of ourselves. We're all complex people who deal with complex intersections of race, gender, class, and I think he really, he understood that and articulated that in a way that I think is, um, I think really fresh and I think really still applicable today and I think really insightful for even the conversations that we want to have now around those topics. Mm -hmm. Right. So just in closing, I'll give a um, quick plug for the, the One Book program. We start mm -hmm. um, with our, uh, well, we start the summer with some of these podcasts, so look for our uh, additional podcasts. But we'll be starting in September with... Um, some lectures and panel discussions from our faculty thinking mm -hmm. about Giovanni's room um, that'll continue through the next year and we're going to touch on a range of themes including conversations about the book um, issues relating to um, sexual identity sexual orientation um, we're going to touch mm -hmm. on some things that um, include bullying and um, kind of understanding who we are and we'll continue that so I would invite the, um, all of our events are open to the public um, and uh, for faculty members to include these in their courses um, for more information, visit www.morainevalley.edu slash Giovanni's Room. And um, with that, I thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks.